Good morning, Swan Hill Christian Center. Thank you for joining me today. Good morning, Pastor Colin and Ingrid. Good morning, elders, deacons. Good morning, church. Let's pray today that as we look at the scriptures, as we have a look at Genesis, the book of Genesis, starting from chapter 1, let's pray that the Holy Spirit will give us wisdom, will guide us in our lives going forward, that will encourage and strengthen us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Move in our hearts today. Give me the right words, Lord, to speak. And Lord, may your spirit speak to every heart in Swan Hill Christian Centre and others who may be listening to, Lord, as they uh, log into Facebook. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the power of your word. Now, Lord, um, move in our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, sometime earlier this year, we were at our GC, our gospel community, like a home group, and there was a question asked, as normally there is at the start of the meeting, so that we can get to know each other. And the question was, what is the most important action another Christian has taken to help you? I was really surprised when it was Diane's turn to speak and she gave this example. When we were first married, we were married in, in a courthouse and, and it was a very simple civic ceremony and then we went back to our home for, for a, a very worldly party. We weren't Christians then. Later we became Christians and, and I decided at our 20-year anniversary, our wedding anniversary, that I'd organise a special function for Diane and myself. And this is what Diane remembered as the most important action of another Christian. So it was at Smorgies in Geelong. It's not there now, but it was an all-you-can-eat venue. And we had a separate room. I organized a whole bunch of people to come from our church and our friends and a pastor to perform a wedding ceremony. I bought her another ring and organized a holiday. And I kept it all secret. So it actually took me quite a bit of uh, energy, quite a bit of sacrifice, quite a bit of time and used my creative powers to to bring about this this special event, particularly for Diane. And when we got there, it was a big surprise to her and I asked her to marry me again and then we went through a ceremony and it was a really great night of celebrating and then we went on our holiday. So this is what Diane remembers as such a special time. And I'm so glad that I used those gifts, those abilities that God had put in me to do good, to do good to my wife. And that's what I want to talk about today, about these abilities that God has given us and how they might help us to do good wherever we go. Let's have a look at Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. So the first thing we learn in Genesis is that God is the creator, that he is creative, and that what he does is good. Now let's turn over to verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then down to verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God made man in his image, and he made them male and female. He made two genders, male and female, and there are only two genders. I just want to bring that to you again today because in this culture we're being forced to accept gender fluidity and of course it's very very dangerous 
when we start undoing the great work or trying to undo the great work that God has done in our communities and in our culture. In Queensland just recently there was a bill passed to do with conversion therapy and that that bill is to stop health practitioners from advising people about gender. So those who have a gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria are no longer able to be advised about their biological sex. The same thing's happening in the ACT. In fact, there are, are now laws are now being passed to 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 criminalise people who advise those who are confused about their sex or gender, and uh, heavy penalties, including jail time, for those even parents who might advise uh, children or other people about their sex or gender. This is coming to Victoria as well and I, I, I just wanted to bring it to you because I think it's certainly a time for prayer over our nation because this could be a, a terrible step to a very destructive step in our culture and society. So in Victoria there's been an inquiry and there will be laws coming to ban conversion therapy. It will be very dangerous for parents and pastors once these bills are passed for, for us to advise people about sex and gender. But men and women are quite different. I've got a few, few, a little list here of some of the differences between male and female. There are obvious biological differences that no one can deny. But also men are bigger and stronger, particularly in the upper body. Women have higher stamina and greater verbal ability. Women are more enthusiastic. Men are more assertive. Women are more interested in asceticism. Men are more interested in ideas. Women are more interested in people. Men more interested in things. The biggest difference between men and women is in agreeableness. Women have a high level of agreeableness to be cooperative and compassionate. Agreeableness enables self-sacrificing, essential for raising infants and children. Men are less agreeable. They have 10 times the incarceration rate and are more aggressive. So I just raise that to say God created us male and female and that's how it will always be no matter what the ungodly culture tries to tell us. But man was made in God's image. And of course, all we know about God, partic particularly at the moment, is that he's creative and what he does is good. And so that's the first attribute that I want to emphasize, is that humans have this capacity to be creative and to do good. And Adam and Eve were given this power to do good. Now, let's have a look at chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, because there's another step that man takes now, which is very important in our development. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So man was given this option, this free will option of eating from the tree, from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now we know that everything God made is good. So this tree and its fruit were good. But what was not good was that man could do something wrong. Everything in the garden was good. Everything was good to eat. Man was given this wonderful opportunity to live in paradise. But of course there was one opportunity to sin. And that's the direction that man took. So when they did sin, this one sin... The result was death. When you eat of it, you shall surely die. And that was the truth. They were given, as a result, death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so there's an incredible truth here that no matter how good we try to be, no matter how good the environment is around us, we only need to make one mistake, one sin, and the wages we receive will be death forever. Only one sin stops us from being forever united with God. No matter how good you might think you're living, 
There's only one way that you're going to be made righteous, and that is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son. And so grace is here right in this picture as well as death. And Adam and Eve made a mistake. They brought eternal death into mankind. But as well as that, they really did have their eyes opened to see the difference between good and evil. Prior to this, they were able to see only good and to do good works. But now suddenly they have the capacity to see evil and not just to see it, but to actually practice evil. And this is a quality that is now introduced into mankind, that we no longer just have the capacity to use God's creative power for good, but we have the same capacity to use this powerful force if we choose for evil. Let's have a look at chapter 4. This is the last scripture that I want to share with you. And I think it's really important in the development of mankind. Chapter 4. Now Adam, this is verse 1, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. These are the first children in creation. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. So we see here the capacity of man to sacrifice. And I want to bring that to you as the second attribute of God that we want to talk about today, this capacity to sacrifice, this second key attribute. They were gifted with an ability to deny themselves. This is incredible that man was able to delay gratification. They were able to bring something of their own and present it to God. It was a way of bargaining with the future, make a sacrifice to please God and therefore to bring blessing on themselves. Abraham certainly had this. When Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son, and it's actually called worship in the Bible, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham had this capacity to sacrifice, and he was obedient to God in that he did sacrifice. And with every sacrifice, with every bargaining with the future, there comes blessing or success. And sacrifice is essential to success. And the Lord says to Abraham, you can stay in Genesis 4, but this is what I am just want to share with you about what the Lord says to Abraham. He says, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So we see that this capacity to sacrifice is in man. And if we partake of this gift, this ability that God gave us, we will always benefit, just as Abraham did, in an incredible way. So Cain and Abel have this capacity to sacrifice. You have this capacity to sacrifice. I call it giving up to get on. It's essential to success. It's the opposite of the world. The world is self-seeking. Christians are sacrificing, have this capacity to sacrifice. A surgeon will put aside 10 years of his life to study and achieve a qualification so that he can operate on people, so he can help so many people, but also so that he can receive a very generous wage. A farmer will put aside seed, and no matter how hungry he gets, he'll keep that seed because he wants to deny eating it so he can have another crop the following year. We use sacrificing so many times in our lives to please our spouses. We need to sacrifice 
spending time with our children, our family, we'll always need to sacrifice for later good. Giving, tithing, investing, loving always involves sacrifice. Praying involves sacrifice. And of course, as happened with Abraham, the first time worship was used in the Bible was in Genesis chapter 2 in that example. Sacrifice is worship. So you have these capacities to be creative, to do good, but also to do evil. And you have this ability to sacrifice. A wolf will eat 40 pounds of meat in one meal. He'll eat everything available. Animals don't sacrifice naturally, but men and women do. So enjoy that. So verse 5, but God, or verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? There's always blessing coming out of doing well, sacrificing properly. Now Cain talked with Abel, verse 8, his brother, and it came to pass while they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So Cain used this power to do evil. He had the choice to do good or evil, and he chose to do evil, and he killed his own brother. Of course, we've seen that incredibly in the world. Last century, communism under Stalin and Mao killed approximately 100 million people, their own brothers. And so we see this incredibly powerful force to do evil. God has made us very powerful people to use this gift that's inside us for incredible good or incredible evil. So here we are with this extraordinary power, with this image of God in us. I And we can use it in the smallest or largest opportunities. We recently started going to a different cafe here in Torquay because under COVID, the cafe that we normally went to, it closed and I think it's been sold now and, and the business obviously collapsed. We started going to a new cafe and Bon Bore as it's called and the first time we went in there and I asked for my usual large flat white and then had to ask for the sugar container so I could put my one sugar into it. And the next time we went there, the following Saturday, when I asked for my flat white, a large flat white, it came back with one sugar in it. So the staff there had noticed the first time I came that I have one sugar and then they were kind enough to give me that one sugar the following week. And, you know, that makes such a difference when people take that little step to do a little bit of extra good. And, of course, now I want to go back there all the time because I've been treated like a valuable customer. You know, whatever you do, you can do a little bit of good. You can use this creative power of God to do good. Just recently, we saw that there was a Victoria Cross awarded posthumously to a young guy called Teddy Sheehan, 18 years old. So in the Second World War, you probably saw this story in the press. During the Second World War, he was serving as a gunner on a naval vessel. And that vessel was attacked by the Japanese and sunk. And all of the, all of the sailors were asked to abandon ship. Well, Teddy Sheehan didn't abandon ship. He strapped himself to his gun and he continued to fire on the Japanese planes as the ship went down. And in fact, until the ship sank. And so he went down with the ship strapped to his gun. And they say that you could still, still see Tracer coming from his gun as the ship was going underwater. It's said that Teddy Sheehan saved 49 lives because... Many of his mates were in the water and the Japanese fighters were strafing them. And of course, his defense stopped the Japanese fighters and, and saved those men's lives. So I think, isn't that incredible that, that this 
man Teddy Sheehan would use his gift of creativity to do good and his ability to sacrifice to save the lives of 49 men and their families. I wonder what the result was of that. It would have been incredible. A result of 49 families, 49 wives, husbands, children, generations since 1942 when that sacrifice occurred. That's just one example. Another example I like is is Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, in Luke 1.38, when she's been asked to, to have a child by the Holy Spirit, when she's been invited to be the one who would give birth to, to the Son of God, and an angel comes to her and, and puts this idea to her, and she says, I am the Lord's servant, verse 38, I am willing to do whatever he wants. So she, by faith, accepts this, this mission to have, to have God, to have the Son of God, to have Jesus, though she's a virgin, though she's never known a man, and she's only very young. And I think in the course of, of having that child, of having God, as she knows that at some point that this child of hers is going to be offered to, to the world. He's going to be someone who will serve all men. And so... It, it's not just a natural uh, bonding for her, not just this ability to have a child like, like we would do in a normal family, but, but there's this concept of being able to give up this person for the good of the world. I guess there's something like that in every child that we have. For mums and dads, when they have a child, particularly mums, there must be this little bit of a concept that at some point, no matter how full of love, no matter how dependent children are in the beginning, there's going to come a point when children are going to need to be independent. And so we're always having children with the future concept of, of losing them. It's an enormous sacrifice. And as I said before, women have this high level of agreeableness, this ability to sacrifice and look after children, to have them, to look after them, to, to nourish them with the knowledge that one day definitely they're going to leave. So Mary, a good example of sacrifice, and perhaps every mum particularly is a good example of God's creativity and God's capacity in man for sacrifice. The last example I want to use, of course, is, is that of Jesus. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And Jesus did just that. He was created for good works. He was created for the greatest works because he was created to die. He was created to give his life. He was created to make the choice to lay down his life for others. Another scripture says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You know, when I spoke about Abraham, I said that he sacrificed his son or God provided a ram in his son's place but he was prepared to sacrifice his son and because he was prepared to give up the most precious part of his own life Abraham was given this this gift of being the father of nations of being the father of multitudes of being the one who if we bless him then through him all nations will be blessed and Mary, another example, but Jesus, of course, is this incredible example of, of laying down his life for the, for, the, for the good of mankind. And there's nothing that we could, we could describe that could be a greater gift than God coming in person. Jesus is the Son of God, but Jesus is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. And so God came himself to give his life. There's no other religion like it. There's no other truth like it. There's nothing so incredible as this fact that Jesus Christ, God, gave his life, laid down his life, gave it so that a way could be opened, so that any person who looks to him, who has faith in him, who believes in him, could receive eternal life, could have their sins completely forgiven, could be given the righteousness of God. And so Jesus made a way for mankind to come to God. The biggest harvest, the seed that was sown 
that has reaped the greatest harvest and now billions of people have found the way to be right with God, the way, the truth and the life through Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus used his creativity. He used his power to sacrifice to do the greatest good in the universe. And now we have this capacity. I have this capacity. So today I, I want to ask you to consider sacrifice, to consider not being afraid to sacrifice, not being afraid to give up, to get on, not being afraid to let go. And I pray that, that you would realize that the sacrifices that you've made, Pastor Colin, you are a hero to me. You are one of the most sacrificing people that I have ever met. You are amazing, the things that you've done, the things that you do. And I know there are other people in this wonderful church who also have been really strong in being able to sacrifice. So many times there's a cost that God asks of us. But we also know that there's an equivalent blessing coming. There's a much greater blessing coming when we do sacrifice, that we can never give up anything for God, that he doesn't pour back. 20, 60, 100 fold to us in this world and the next. So let's not be afraid to sacrifice. And let's use the power that we have, this creative power inside us that God put in us when he breathed into our lives to do good in our marriage, with our family. Whether it's under COVID restrictions or whether we're completely free to go or do whatever we choose. Let's pursue the good that God intended always for us. Will you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, help us, Lord, as we offer our lives again to you today. Lord, for those of us who haven't received you, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that there would be a decision made this morning, Lord, today, to receive you and begin the greatest of most exciting journeys with Jesus Christ the journey into truth, the journey into life, the journey into fruitfulness. And Lord, for those of us who are Christians, who have received you as Saviour, Lord, help us to use our days to do good. Help us to use our creative power to lift other people, to encourage them, to, strength, to strengthen them, to take on great projects that might bring the greatest good to mankind. Bless you. Swan Hill Christian Centre. You're an amazing church. Let's stay excited about Jesus and let's, let's build and let's be filled with hope in Jesus' name. God bless you.